just like last time. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get started. What chapter do we want to start on? Five. 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 Let's start on five. Okay. So, chapter five. Um, thank you. Got it. Okay. So, chapter five, all about energy, and my my favorite uh, chapter actually. And I warn my students that if you're going to mess up in chapter five, it's going to be what the sign. All right, if you'll mess up the sign, uh, because the signs here in thermochemistry are really important. It tells you the direction that energy is flowing. So typically as uh, chemists studying chemical reactions, the reaction is always the system. The system is the thing under study. So it's the reaction. Unfortunately, we are human and we are very um, selfish. And we oftentimes think we are the system. So when we feel heat coming off of a, a reaction, we're like, oh yeah, like delta T is positive, Q is positive. But no, we are the surroundings to the reaction. So when we feel a heat increase, like in calorimetry, all right, coffee cup calorimetry, you did a reaction, the temperature of the thermometer went up. That indicates that the reaction was actually exothermic exothermic reactions have what sign of q what sign of delta h negative heat was released by the reaction and we the surroundings felt it so just you know during the exam just think to yourself once i am selfish i am not the system the chemical reaction is the system right if you're going to mess up on this exam it's going to be a sign and it's because you're selfish right so Keep that in mind. All right, so uh, the, the ideas of thermochemistry here, uh, we introduced energy in uh, chapter one earlier. We talked about kinetic energy, potential energy. So uh, in this question, okay, so which of the following scenarios does potential energy decrease? So what equation do we use to describe potential energy? Do you remember? This equation is not given to you. It's the Coulombic's attractions equation where potential energy is proportional to Q1, Q2 over distance. So I talked about this previously, I think in the first review session, but we never ever calculate potential energy. We only ever see how it changes. So we oftentimes use this Coulombic attractions equation, but I like to think about it in terms of the graph instead, where we have potential energy on the y axis, distance on the um, x-axis and so when i draw a graph um, below the x-axis this interaction is what between oppositely charged particles or the same charged particles opposite yeah so this bottom is attractions all right that's how we get negative numbers when we have a negative charge uh, multiplied by a positive charge. So that's how we get negative numbers versus if we have, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the, in, the mirror image here, the red line here, this is repulsions, repulsions, and this is just between any like charged thing. So positive, positive, or negative, negative, doesn't matter. It'll make the numerator positive in both cases. All right. And so the idea here is we feel repulsive forces get stronger when we bring two magnets together. You guys over there. Uh, versus um, attractions, we feel the attractive forces between particles uh, even stronger when the distance is really close, when they're really close together. So that's how we read this graph. So I just know that this, this equation is this graph. So we should be able to answer this question. You're in the same place, you always are. Yeah, yeah, yes. I just recognize my students, okay? And it's weird because there's so many people here. All right, so let's look at these. Um, let's let's say we bring two positively charged particles closer together. So I like to kind of break it down and think about, okay, if it's two positively charged things, are we talking about repulsions or attractions? Repul repulsions, po two positively charged, two positive. Yeah, so repulsion. So I'm operating in this top part of, of the graph um, and we're bringing them closer together. So D is changing how? It's getting smaller. So then you just look at the graph. Is potential energy increasing or decreasing? 
increasing yeah potential energy increases if we're in the repulsive region and we go along the x-axis towards uh smaller distances all right reducing the speed of a charged particle how does that change potential energy it doesn't yeah that's the trick question it does change kinetic energy yes okay bringing two negatively charged particles closer together Repulsion, distance smaller, potential energy goes up. Very good. All right. So that's not that one. Bringing two oppositely charged particles closer together. Yes. Okay. All right. You want me to go faster? All right. Well, let's just look at this next one. Doubling the charge of two separated negatively charged particles. How does potential energy change in uh, that instance? Doubling the charge of two separated negatively charged particles. Particles. So if I have a negative two and a negative, or sorry, negative one and a negative one separated by some distance, if I double the charge, does potential energy change? Yes, it does. If I have two magnets, okay, like this far apart, if I double the strength of the magnet, will the repulsion change? Yes, it will. Yeah, if I double the strength of my magnets, yes, it will. Because when we change the charge, in all the other examples, we changed D. In this example, in E, we are not changing D, we are changing Q1, Q2. So instead of being like a negative one positive, or sorry, negative one, negative one, it's a negative two, negative two. See what I mean? Yeah, okay. So, uh, but in that case, uh, potential energy still increases. Uh, but we're, dub we're uh, because the magnets in this case are stronger. Okay, all right. All right, is there a certain question in uh, section five or chapter five we wanna do? The next one, okay. For which following uh, process is internal energy change for the system always positive? So let's recall what the equation is for internal energy. Actually, let me just um, get on my soapbox and um, uh, uh, bring up a misconception that uh, students have. So oftentimes, at least in my class, I teach that internal energy E is equal to all of the kinetic energy of the system plus all of the potential energy of the system. That's just E, okay? We compared the internal energy of a gas to a solid, and we very confidently can say that what phase has higher internal energy, a uh, gas or a solid? Gas, because there's a lot more kinetic energy, all right, um, that whole idea there that when particles are close, they have a negative potential energy. So, so solid, this would be a, a negative number for the solid. So yeah, a gas has much more internal energy. The thing is, is that we never calculate just plain old E, the internal energy of the system at one condition. Oftentimes chemists talk about delta E change of, of internal energy for a process. We can measure that, that's the thing. And I think that's a misconception. I think it was brought up in lab. Um, I don't know who spread it, but we cannot measure E, but we can measure delta E. Delta E, all right, change of internal energy. So you can think of it as, you know, E final minus initial, but there's also another equation we can use to calculate delta E, what's that? Things that we can actually measure. Q plus W, all right? So delta E is, uh, you know, final minus initial of E. We know that as a delta term, but experimentally we can compare um, delta E to the Q gained by the system and the work done, uh, done on the system. So this is where you're gonna screw up signs, all right? Because we need to think about how does Q and W for the system what are the signs implied by these things? Because we are looking for a positive delta E. We want a positive delta E. So that means what signs of Q and W are we looking for? Two positive ones, all right. So the idea here is that a positive Q of the system means that the uh, system, does it give off energy or heat or does it gain energy or heat? It gains, yeah. So we want to look for the system gaining heat energy, all right? So we are looking for um, either A or C because we don't want to lose heat, right? The reaction or the system losing heat is implying a negative sign that heat is being transferred to the surroundings, all right? 
uh, oftentimes if heat is transferred to the surroundings, what do we as the surroundings observe? Oh, no. So if heat is released to the surroundings. Yeah, if it's sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, so if heat is leaving this, uh, the system, that's a negative Q. That's a negative delta H. That's an exothermal leaving the system. So what we observe is heat. Yeah, it gets hot. It gets hot. That's an exothermic reaction, which is weird. It's counterintuitive. Versus in this case, with a positive Q, if we were holding the system, what would we observe? We would feel it get cold. It would get colder, right? Um, in, in that case, because it's absorbing heat. It's absorbing heat from us, the surroundings. Okay, so uh, these are the two that have um, positive Q systems, um, A and C. So we can, we can disregard B and D. So now we are looking at work. All right. So uh, my idea of work, I just I memorized this equation. All right. Work equals of the system, of course, negative pressure delta V. So what this means is if your system uh, changes volume like gases, it's going to do uh, uh, work is going to be involved. So the idea is we want to know what is the sign of work of the system depending on uh, uh, the volume change here. If it expands against a external pressure or it contracts during, uh, uh, due to an external pressure. So expand positive delta V, contracts negative delta V. And so if you plug that into this equation, this negative sign is very important. It will tell you the sign of work of the system. But I always like to um, uh, just think about it. Work uh, is done on your system, that's a positive, W. So the idea is if you do work on a system, all right, I'm the, I'm the surroundings. If I do work on it, I'm going to like, you know, like press on the plunger or make the thing small. So that's a negative delta V. So you are the surroundings, remember? So you're like squeezing it. You're putting work into the system. So that's a negative delta V that the volume gets smaller. So that's a positive work done on the system versus when the uh, system does work, when the system does work, it's pushing up against an external pressure. It's doing work on the surrounding. So that's a negative uh, work of system. Yeah, question. When something expands, its volume it increases. Yeah. When something contracts, its, its volume gets smaller, so that's a negative delta V. All right, so um, expands during, uh, expands, so that's a positive delta V, so that's a negative work. We don't want that one. Contracts is a negative delta V, ends up being a positive W. That's, that's the one we want, and the answer is C. Is that the right answer? Is that the right answer? Yes? Okay, cool, all right. Other questions in chapter five? 19. Okay, calculate bond enthalpies. Yeah, all right. I love these questions. So um, in this class, I think there are three ways we calculate uh, delta H's of a reaction, I think. The first way is we can use calorimetry where we utilize Q equals MCAT, all right? Where we can calculate delta H of a, some type of reaction. Usually it's like a dissolution thing where we take Q of the reaction over the number of moles that we're reacting. That's one way we can calculate delta H. That's the hardest way, right? We need to use the first law of thermodynamics. There's always a negative sign floating around, all right? That's one of the ways we do it. That's how we do it experimentally. We do it experimentally. The other ways we can uh, calculate delta H's of reaction um, are, what's the other way? We can use um, delta H's of formation. Those are book values, okay? That's where we do uh, formation. We take the sum of the formation values of the products and we subtract the formation values of the reactants. Do we remember that? Products minus reactants, okay? That's the second way. The third way is using bond enthalpies, where we look at the strength of bonds, we consider, okay, it always takes energy to break bonds. Whenever we form bonds, that is an ex exothermic 
component, all right, we're bringing two attracted atoms together so energy is actually released. And so we can take advantage of that component. If we know how much it costs us to break everything and then how much stuff, how much energy we get back when we form everything, we can uh, figure out um, uh, you know, the total delta H for a, pro a process. Actually, I forgot one. Uh, between one and two, actually the first one, we can use Hess's law. I forgot, that's the first one, Hess's law. Where we can take like a bunch of puzzle pieces of reactions, piece them together, flip things, multiply by coefficient to get an overall reaction. Actually, all of these basically utilize Hess's law in a, in a sense, all right? They all are contingent on that. So there's actually four ways. So I forgot about that one. All right, so this question is which one? one zero, one, two, or three? Four, there's no four. Okay, yeah, three. We need to take inventory of how much it costs us to break everything, and then uh, how much energy we get back when we make everything. I like to compare this to Legos, all right? We have a bunch of Lego pieces on our reactants. We need to break those up into individual Lego pieces. That's gonna cost us something, but then we're gonna form new bonds as our products. That's gonna give us energy back. Remember, always costs to break things, we always get energy back when we form chemical bonds. Okay, so I like to take inventory. We break our reactants, but we need to keep in mind coefficients here. So there's only one um, ethanol molecule, but how many molecules of oxygen are there? There's three, right? There's three, there's three there. So this is gonna help us figure out how many um, uh, each of each bond we need to make. I like to take inventory, of this, I just did this with in office hours. Okay, um, so let's look at this. Uh, uh, we take inventory of the bonds. So I'm gonna, I, I notice these carbon hydrogen bonds. Okay, there's five of them. So carbon hydrogen, there's five of them. And so that's going to have a certain energy value that I have somewhere, uh, but we need to do all the bonds, all right? So we have this carbon carbon bond in the middle. If you're gonna forget a bond, it's gonna be that one. I forget it all the time. So there's a carbon carbon bond. Next, there's a carbon oxygen bond. How many of those are there? Just one. And then an oxygen hydrogen bond. So that's everything that we need to break. So let me get some more colors here. So that's everything we had to break. So there's just one of the rest of those. Did I break all of the reactants? Did I release all of my Lego pieces? So I have just loose Lego pieces on my reactant side? No, what else do I have to break? Oxygen, yeah, so if I break that oxygen, all right, that's an oxygen oxygen double bond, but how many of them do I have to break? Three of them, because there's three of those molecules, so three. So three oxygen oxygen double bonds. So that's going to cost me something thermodynamically. So I look up these bond enthalpies. So I do five times carbon hydrogen, so 413. One carbon carbon, so 348. Carbon oxygen is 358, OH is um, 463, and then oxygen oxygen double bond is right here. It's 495, but I need to do that times three. A common mistake with when dealing with double bonds is students think that uh, this chart, okay, this chart is showing that the total strength of this double bond is almost 500 kilojoules per mole. You don't have to double count. You don't have to count the single and the double bond. You just, you just break exactly what's shown as is. You don't have to break, you know, the single and the double. That's not how this chart works. All right. So the total energy of that double bond is nearly 500. So you just add those numbers up and that gives you how much energy it costs to break up all of your Lego pieces, um, which is something. Um, it costs me 4,719 kilojoules to break everything. That is an endothermic component to break all that stuff up. The exothermic component is uh, forming, forming all those uh, chemical bonds on the product side, all right? So we did break. This is my favorite. I love to break. And then usually I just write make. And so we do the same thing being cognizant of coefficients. So there's uh, two CO2s and three waters. So total, how many um, carbon oxygen double bonds are there? There's one, two, 
but there's four because there's two CO2 molecules total. So there's four carbon double bond oxygens we need to break that, or sorry, make. How many um, water, um, OH bonds do we have to make? Six, yes, because each water has two, there's three molecules. So then we just look up those numbers. So four times CO, yeah, so a CO double bond has a huge amount of energy, all right? So 799. All right. Even without doing this, um, doing this, can you predict the sign of this reaction? Let's just use our intuition. Can we just predict the sign? Negative. How do you know it's negative? Do you just guess 50 50? It's a combustion reaction. Yes. Yeah. So do use your intuition a little bit. All right. Uh, do uh, use your intuition a little bit. We should get a negative overall reaction at the end. If you don't, then something went wrong. All right. Okay. So, because we see here that CO double bond is like a huge, a huge amount of energy that we're forming, that this is going to give us a lot of energy back because it's such a strong bond. All right. So, um, OH, we have six times OH, so 463. And so we get when we add those up, um, it's something like 5,974. Uh, 5, kilojoules. All right. So this is the energy we get back. This is the exothermic component. So if we look back at the equation of this, um, how we approach these questions, it's always the energy to break minus the energy to make. And the reason it's minus make is because make is an exothermic component. All right. So oftentimes students, they, they confuse it. We're breaking reactants, yes, and forming products. So don't get confused that it's reactants minus products. I never say it that way. I always say delta H is the energy of the bonds broken minus the energy of the bonds formed. It just so happens that the bonds we break are reactants and the bonds we formed are products. So then you get the answer and you see that it's a negative, it's a negative value. So it's negative 1255 kilojoules. Just look at the key. Okay. So the question is here, are the reactants the only ones that are broken? Is it ever the products? So the question here, just think about Legos. Yes, when you, the things you start with, you need to break up the things that you start with and um, you know, put the new pieces together. That's, we're taking inventory of the pieces, how we're piecing them together to form the products. Is the bond enthalpy chart is not the supplemental? No, you don't need to memorize the bond enthalpies. They will be given to you in the question. It's not, uh, it's not uh, feasible for you to memorize these, but you should know and see trends here like double bonds, uh, uh, some trends here like a carbon carbon single versus a double bond. The double bond is uh, uh, has more, it takes more energy to separate because the atoms are closer together in a double bond. Okay. Um, no, yeah, don't have to memorize it. Don't memorize it. Quick list of important things memorized for this term. Um, I'm not going to do that. Can you do 18 and 17? Is it always reactants minus products? I don't like to memorize it like that. It's, it's break minus make. Can we do eight? All right, I don't know. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna bring it to you guys here. What question do you wanna do? Uh, let's do a little bit more in five. Can we do a calorimetry question? 16, can we do 16? Okay. Should I tell my story? Okay. So uh, last year, uh, so this is my second year teaching here on main campus. And last year was my first, all right? And so it was the new, first time I experienced your guys' exams. So when I got uh, midterm two, all right, uh, to proofread, right? Because all the instructors, you all take the same exam. We, we proofread them, right? And um, I uh, tried to take the exam as fast as possible, as fast as possible. I didn't write a single thing down. I did it all on my calculator. Okay, so this is for midterm two. I did it in seven minutes and I did it and I'm smart, okay? And uh, I got one question wrong. Got one question wrong and it was this one. And do you know what I messed up? The sign. Ugh. I got the number right, but I put the wrong freaking sign. So the idea here, all right, 
with calorimetry, right? If we if we look back at uh, so don't so learn from my mistakes, okay? I was so mad. If we go back to the types of enthalpies we calculate, calorimetry, we're we're taking. Hey guys, let's let's focus. Yes, fun story. Let's focus. Learn from my mistakes. We are taking our observations and changes of temperatures of things that we can measure, relating it to things that we can't measure. When we put the thermometer into uh, the coffee cup, we're measuring the temperature of the water or the solution changes. Is our temp is our thermometer touching the individual particles of salt that are dissolving? No, they're not. They, it's, it's collecting the total temperature of the water changes or the solution changes. So we're utilizing um, the first law of thermodynamics uh, here, where the heat lost by the reaction is always gained by something else. All right. So typically, when we think about like exothermic reactions, the heat lost by the reaction is always gained by the solution. So if we think about our cup here, all right, we have water, we have a salt. If the solution heats up, if the solution, if the delta T, okay, the temperature of the water increases, that means the solution gained heat. Where did that heat come from? The so if the, the solution is the surroundings, the solution is the surroundings. So if the solution gains that heat, it had to come from the reaction. So what kind of reaction is that? Endo or exothermic? exothermic the reaction gave off heat it heat up heated up the water right versus if you mix a salt in water and the temperature goes down that means the reaction had to absorb heat and it came from the water itself so the delta t will be a negative number and so what would the sign of enthalpy be for that scenario positive because the reaction gained the heat, we as the, uh, uh, the surroundings observed a temperature decrease. So based upon what I just said, all right, temperature increases in the water means exothermic reaction. Temperature decreases in the reaction means endothermic reaction, positive value. So based upon just that, what is the sign of this answer? Temperature is doing what? It's increasing. So that means what should the sign of delta H be? negative negative all right okay the temperature is increasing in the solution the solution is the surroundings that heat had to come from somewhere it was the reaction when reactions release heat those are exothermic reactions those are negative signs all right uh be smarter than me yes uh so in this case because the temperature is increasing all right, Q reaction is negative. Also delta H of the reaction is negative. Both of those values are negative, yes, okay. All right, so let's actually solve this. So the idea here is when we have our thermometer in the solution, we can't measure Q reaction, but we can measure Q solution because Q solution, uh, uh, we can apply the idea of Q equals MCAT, all right? If we know the mass, do we know the mass of the solution? Yeah, that's given. Do we know the specific heat of the solution? Yeah, it's the same as water. Do we know the delta T of the solution? Yes, we do. So these things we can measure and we're gonna relate it back to Q of the reaction. Um, the second place that you will, uh, you will mess up if you do this question is mass of the solution. What is the mass of the solution? Is it 120? No, it's everything in the cup. Everything in the cup heats up, all right? So the mass of the solution is actually uh, 126.23 grams. Everything in the cup heats up. You start with 120 grams of water, you add six grams of salt, right? If everything in the cup heats up, that's 126 grams total that heats up. So that's the second place you'll mess up after the sign. Okay, all right. So, uh, okay, specific heat of water is 4.184 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. And then finally, delta T. What is delta T? It's whatever. So delta T, all deltas, okay, all deltas are always final minus initial. Always final minus initial. So in this case, delta T will be a positive number because the temperature increased. And so I think we get something like 8.6 degrees Celsius. All right.
I think that's what my key says. I don't know, but I'm wrong all the time. Right. And so we get negative Q reaction equals 400 or 4,542 joules. So that means that the solution gained 4,000 joules of heat because the temperature increased. But that means, what does that mean in terms of Q reaction? That it gave off that heat. So Q reaction is negative 4,542 joules. Is that my answer? No, the question is asking for not Q, it's asking for delta H. So we need to um, scale this into a mole amount. That's it, because this heat amount is specific to this amount of salt dissolving, right? If we change the amount of salt dissolving, this, this Q would change. So we just wanna scale it into a mole amount. And so we use the last uh, equation here that eight delta H reaction equals Q reaction, the number we just calculated over the mole amount of stuff that we used. Um, in this case, the salt. So I'm just gonna change Q reaction to kilojoules. So 4.542 kilojoules over um, moles of calcium chloride. So just convert this gram amount to moles, that's it. So, um, so 6.23 grams divided by 110.98 grams per mole. And so you get something like negative 80.9 kilojoules per mole, all right? And again, check the sign, check the sign. The negative delta H value is implying what kind of reaction is occurring, exothermic. And so we would expect in an exothermic reaction that the water would what? Heat up or get colder? Heat up. And is that what we observe? Yes, it is. So there we go. So take half a second to check your sign because I didn't. I didn't when I did that exam. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So what question? Okay. 17. Yeah, we'll do 17 because it's literally the same. Okay, so um, you did coffee cup calorimetry in lab, right? You utilized the specific heat of water. You did Q equals MCAT. Bomb calorimetry is a little bit different, but it's, I think it's easier. You're still using the first law of thermodynamics where we're saying that the heat lost by some reaction is gained by something else, but in this case, it's the calorimeter for bomb calorimetry. It's the same idea. Heat lost somewhere is gained by something else. So if we look at this reaction, all right, I tell you, we are burning two grams of titanium, all right, by this reaction, we want to calculate the delta H of reaction in kilojoules per mole. Um, the temperature of the calorimeter increases from 25 to 90. What is delta H? So just looking at this, predict what the sign of delta H will be. Negative, why is it negative? Temperature went up, yes. The calorimeter got heated up because the reaction released a lot of energy. So we should expect negative values here, all right? So take the half second to just think about that. All right, so the difference is for this reaction, or sorry, this kind of question, and it's almost like too easy that students don't think it's right, but it is. Look at the values given. So in previous in the previous um, example, we used um, the specific heat of water, right? We we used Q equals um, MCAT, where we used specific heat. Okay, and the specific heat of water is four point one eight four joule per gram degree Celsius, where we need to know how what mass of water is involved or mass of the solution. Look at the um, energy term that's given in this question. Kilojoules per degree Celsius. Is that a specific heat? No, that's a heat capacity, all right? So just by looking at units here, do we need the mass of water in the calorimeter at all? No, in order to get energy, how do we get rid, all we have to do, okay? To get an energy term, all we have to do is multiply this heat capacity by the change of temperature, that's it. Because look, the unit is kilojoules per degree Celsius. If I multiply by delta T, all I have left is kilojoules. So this question is almost too easy, right? Where the idea is that the Q involved with your calorimeter is equal 
to the uh, heat capacity of your calorimeter times delta T. So the idea of the seven, 750 grams, it's actually a distractor. You don't need that because there's no gram unit in heat capacity. Typically, the heat capacity of your uh, calorimeter is determined uh, by calibrating it. And so that's where that number comes from. It was calibrated uh, before I wrote the question. All right, so uh, we just multiply those two numbers together. All right, so uh, the negative of your uh, reaction is equal to C cal delta T. And so if we put that together, we take 9.84 kilojoules per degree Celsius times delta T. Um, I think if you get delta T final minus initial is something like six, six, six. Wow. I make up these numbers. I shouldn't have should change that. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So then we multiply by that delta T value. Okay. The change of temperature. All right. And this tells us how much energy required to heat up that calorimeter. So we get something like 600, 550 kilojoules. Is that my answer? No, it's not. So that is negative Q reaction, right? So positive Q reaction will just be the negative of, negative of that. So we see that the reaction gave off six, uh, 655 kilojoules of energy. Is that my answer? No, it's the right sign though. We need to turn this into Delta H. So we just have to divide by the mole amount just like before, all right? So this Q is specific to this amount of stuff that's reacting. We just wanna um, uh, uh, convert this into a per mole basis. So we divide a Q reaction over the mole amount of stuff that's reacting just like before, all right? My stuff is all messed up, give myself more room. All right, so we just divide by the number of moles of titanium that's reacting, so negative. 655 kilojoules over uh, 2.060 grams of titanium over 47.88 grams per mole. And we get a huge negative number. So negative 15,200 kilojoules per mole. So that means for every mole of titanium that you combust, you will get 15,000 kilojoules of energy out. That's a lot. Okay. So uh, I would say this question, very similar setup to, um, very similar setup to coffee cup calorimetry. All right. We still do the whole negative Q equals positive Q of the thing we can measure. We do the whole Delta H reaction. It's Q reaction over moles. The only difference is how we're measuring the Delta T. In bomb we measure the delta T and use heat capacity, total heat capacity of the bomb. You have to be given that, you have to be given it. Versus in coffee cup, we need to know the mass of solution and the specific heat of water, which you already know. Okay, all right, what's next? Thirteen, I heard 13 twice, okay. Okay, this will be the last chapter 15 we do, or five, sorry. Okay. So given the following delta H values, calculate the delta H of formation of blah. Okay, so this question um, utilizes a couple things. So let's go back to this this thing, okay? The different ways we can calculate delta H, we did uh calorimetry right we did bonds now this question actually combines both hess's law and heats of formation both of them so this one is a little bit more difficult so let's go back all right so given these delta h values calculate the delta h of formation for um iron iron three chloride so uh we're doing, you're, we're doing Hess's law. I've given you puzzle pieces. You need to figure out how to combine things uh, to get the target reaction. The problem is, is did I directly give you the target reaction? No, I'm evil. 
I didn't give you the target reaction, but can you get the target reaction? Yes, because you should know what a formation reaction looks like. The enthalpy of formation for any substance by definition is you take that substance, it's, it's, it's uh, one mole of it as its product, and you take its elements in their most stable state and you form them. You form one mole of that product. So I, excuse me, didn't give you the target reaction, but we can figure it out. We want the formation of iron three chloride. So is that substance a reactant or a product? Product, yes, because we're forming it. So iron three chloride, solid, that's my product. So the reactants are the elements that make up that thing um, in their most stable state. So iron in its most stable state is what? A solid. What about chlorine? It's Cl2 gas, yes. So now you just uh, use the coefficients and make sure that you only form one mole of your product. That's important because it's by definition, it's only one mole. Because what you'll see here is that the coefficient we want in front of uh, chlorine is actually three halves, but that's okay, that's okay. Because the whole idea is we wanna make one mole of product. So that is my target reaction. I need to manipulate these given reactions, these puzzle pieces, and get this target reaction and do the same to the enthalpies, all right? Because I give you the enthalpy values, but I'm an evil witch and I didn't give you all the puzzle pieces, right? I didn't give you this reaction, but can we get it? Yes, we can, just like we did for the target reaction. And then it will look like every Hess's law question you've ever seen before. The only, the, the big idea here though, is that I didn't straight up give you some of the reactions. You had to get it from formation values. So, um, uh, so recognize that this formation of iron two chloride, it represents a chemical reaction. So we can do the same thing. So the idea here is that iron two chloride is a product. So I'm just gonna erase this real quick and we'll, um, we'll just rewrite the question, the, the reaction, what it should be. So our product should be that iron two chloride solid. So we think the same thing, iron in its most stable state is iron solid. And then we have chlorine gas, all right? And then, oh, look, the coefficients are all good. So it's one, 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 perfect. So now we, now we have our target reaction. Now we have our two puzzle pieces we can play with, okay? Now we can do Hess's law and manipulate the equations. So the lead up, I think is the hard part, the lead up to that, where I didn't explicitly give you uh, the formation, or sorry, the, the uh, equations, the balanced equations involved. Yeah. Um, I want three chlorides. So if I have um, one chlorine gas molecule, that's two chlorine molecules. But if I have two chlorine molecules, then I'll have four chlorine atoms. Sorry, I meant atoms. So I, but I don't want that. I want three of them. So I have three halves because three halves times two chlorines per molecule equals three. Yeah. Yeah. So fractions are absolutely allowed and they're preferred because we don't want to, we don't want to do like we did in um, combustion reactions where we got rid of the fraction. Don't do that here. It's, we make one mole of stuff. Okay, so um, now it's the puzzle game. It's my favorite. I just uh, locate, I, I look at one element at a time and just make sure that um, it matches in terms of its location and its coefficient. So I'm gonna focus on um, iron chloride, iron three chloride. All right, so where is that? So that's right here. So then I ask myself uh, in the given reaction is the iron three chloride on the right side? No, so how do we fix that? We flip it. Okay, so that means if we flip it, we multiply the delta H by negative one. Is it in the right number? Do we have the right number? No, we don't. So what do we do? We divide by two. So we need to do both of those things. So I'm gonna rewrite the equation. So um, flipped and divided by two. So we have iron chloride, uh, air. I'm just gonna drop the states because I'm lazy. Um, plus half a chlorine gas gives us one iron three chloride. So that puts the iron three chloride in the right spot. All right, 
So now if we look at this, uh, our target reaction, we need iron solid, all right? We don't want this iron two chloride. I don't want that in there. That's not in my target reaction. So I need to get rid of that. So I can use the last reaction that's left over to get rid of it. So how do I get rid of this? Um, do I want to, the next reaction I add, do I want iron two chloride to be on the reactant side or the product side to get rid of this? The products, yeah. So if it's on the products, if they're opposite of one another, they'll cancel out. So ask yourself, the reaction that's left, is that iron two chloride on the right side to do that? Yes, it is. So I'm just going to add that reaction as is and pray that I have the right chlorines at the end because there's literally nothing else, no other reactions to use. So let's just rewrite this reaction one as written um, and see what we get. Um, so I have iron plus chlorine gas gives us iron to chloride. So let's cancel out what we can. Uh, so iron chlorides, iron two chlorides cancel. All right, and then how many chlorines is this? Three halves or 1.5, whatever, uh, three halves. Is that my target reaction, what's left over? Yes, it is. So now we add the delta H's, um, how we manipulated them. So uh, th those are here. So I didn't do anything to reaction one. So I'm gonna um, add uh, the next reaction, um, add negative uh, 115.4 uh, divided by two. And so that's the answer, that's the delta H. So this question, this one's tricky. I'm evil. It's not just a uh, Hess's law, you know, put the puzzle pieces together, but I added that element of, do you know what a formation reaction is? Yeah. Do you, so the question is, can we do products minus reactants for this? You would have to have formation values. Do you have formation values? Yeah, we have at least one, but do you know where to put that? Because this is not a formation reaction. Because when you're given a table or a list of formation reactions, yes, you do products minus some of products minus some of reactants. But in this question, you're not given all formation react uh, formation values. Did you get the same answer? I mean, if it works via Hess as well, yeah, that's another way to do it, maybe mathematically, but I just show it this way, all right? There might be other ways to do that, okay. Um, can you see extra questions like 13 on the exam? Um, there's lots of resources out there, all right. Um, for question 17, could we be asked to calculate the total heat capacity? Um, yes, you could, but you would have to be given um, the Q component. So basically, uh, you know, there can only be one unknown. So if we ask for total heat capacity, we, we would have to give you the heat component of, um, of that equation. Okay, what's next? Okay, chapter, let's do chapter four. Three, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this reaction, I started with reaction two first. I flipped it and divided everything by two all at the same time. So see how the products are now the reactants and all of the coefficients are divided by two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so the question was number three. Yeah. Okay. Let's write the net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between blah and blah. So in this question, so we're, we're switching to uh, solution chemistry. So uh, solutions in aqueous, solution, in aqueous solution. So the idea is in chapter three, we talked about chemical reactions, but it was typically between gases and solids. So in chapter four, we talk about chemical reactions, specifically double displacement reactions, uh, single displacement reactions, neutralization reactions. 
these are happening in water. So there's uh, this idea of things dissolved in water give rise to different properties. I actually, I'm gonna just go back, to, let's just start at one because I wanna give you also recognize that, you know, I wouldn't be putting these on a review if I didn't think they were important. Questions like this, uh, this first one, you know, identifying weak, strong, non-electrolytes. These are low hanging fruit questions. I want you to get these ones right. So let's review um, the idea of what do these things actually look like when they dissolve in water? So we can have strong, weak, or non-electrolytes. Um, which one, what kind of electrolyte does not conduct electricity? Non-electrolytes. So what do you, what do we look for in a, in a compound for a non-electrolyte? We look for um, uh, all non-metals, all right? So molecular compounds, okay? Remember our naming schemes, all right? When, in chapter two, when we named things, when we did like, you know, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur tetra, tetrafluoride, something like that, those were all molecular compounds. Are molecular compounds composed of ions? No, they're not. So when you dissolve in them in uh, water, they will not form ions. If there are no ions, it will not conduct electricity. All right. So you want to look for things that are composed of all nonmetals. So which one of these uh, will be uh, a non-electrolyte? So something like SO3, right, is a uh, non-electrolyte. Um, there are some exceptions in here. So let's look at some other, uh, the other ideas here. So strong electrolytes are always things that are dissolved that are ionic. Meaning if you use ionic naming rules to name it, then it's a strong electrolyte. So like dig back chapter two naming rules. Um, also ionic compounds, also strong acids uh, are strong electrolytes. Okay, so there's seven to memorize. Just memorize the seven strong acids, because then everything else, if it's not one of the seven strong and it's an acid, then what kind of acid is it? A weak acid. So that brings us to weak electrolytes. They're always things that are either weak acids or weak bases. There's only one weak base you need to know. What is that? NH3. All right. And so weak acids are all the things that uh, are not strong acids. The seven strong acids, uh, please read the book. So, okay, let's go through this. Let's identify the strong electrolytes. So, well, let's just go through them one at a time. KOH, what kind of substance is that? Okay, it's a base, yes. And it's also, how would you name it? Okay, it's, yes, it's a strong base, very good. Uh, yeah, I wanna make it even simpler. How would you name it? Potassium hydroxide, what kind of naming rules is that? Ionic, so it has to be a strong electrolyte. Yes, it's a strong base too, but I, I wanna make it even simpler. KOH is a strong uh, electrolyte. Uh, uh, sodium chloride is also a strong electrolyte because both of them are ionic. So the next one, nitric acid, what kind, what, so it's an acid, what kind of acid? It is one of the strong, yes, so it's a strong electrolyte. What about H2SO4? Strong, yes, it's one of the strong. H2SO3, weak, yes, it's one of the weak acids. So I think the strongs, um, HCl, HBr, HI, uh, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, what, am, what else am I missing? Oh, uh, chloric acid and perchloric acid. Is that it? Yeah, that's it, okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so we already did SO3. It's a non-electrolyte. Why is it? Uh, why is it a non-electrolyte? Because it's all non-metals. How would you name it? SO3, sulfur trioxide. Yeah. So it's molecular naming. So it's non non-electrolyte. Okay. NH3, weak. It's a weak base. Uh, calcium chloride, strong because it's ionic. What about this last one? Yeah, this one's a tricky one. All right. This is a tricky one because I said, um, you know, strong electrolytes, there are things that are ionic, you know, strong acids, strong bases. Sometimes students think that this is a base because there's an OH attached to it. That's not a base. What is this? You know what this is. You drew it in, in chapter two. 
This is methanol. Methanol is not a base, it's an organic molecule. So this is actually a non, this is a non-electrolyte. Just because there's an OH, that's not a hydroxide ion. It's a hydroxyl group to make it an alcohol, right? So uh, methanol is not composed of ions. That's like a nice trick, trick question. Okay, all right. Because in order for it to be a strong base, the OH has to be attached to what? A metal cation. It has to be a cation, right? Because we need ions to split apart for, uh, you know, forming the uh, ionic thing. So which diagram depicts an aqueous solution of ethanol? So this combines the ideas of, you know, conceptual and uh, um, uh, like applying. So recognize ethanol would adopt what kind of electrolyte solution in, when dissolved in water? What kind of substance is it? Molecular, so it's going to be what type of electrolyte? Non, yes, yeah. so which picture is that? Which one of these pictures depicts a non-electrolyte? None of them, yes, but let's go through these and figure out what they do look like. A is what kind of electrolyte? Weak. What's an example of a substance that would adopt this picture? H, H, HCl? No, HF, something like HF, it's a weak acid. All right, the next one, what kind of electrolyte is that? Strong, okay. What about the last one? Also strong. Right. The difference between B and uh, C, B could be something like NaCl, right? Uh, C could be something like, uh, okay, something that's strong, can't think of it, lithium oxide, something like that, All right? Two cations, one anion, all right? Something like that, okay. All right, so now let's uh, actually do question three. Because the idea here is to get to a net ionic equation, we need to write a full ionic equation, meaning we need to identify what these things look like in solution. So um, I know, what is, what is this? What is this thing? What's that? That's acetic acid. So this is an acid. We got an acid. What is this? That's a base. So what kind of reactions taking place? A neutralization reaction. All right. So we have an acid, HC2H3O2. Uh, it's aqueous. It's combining with strontium hydroxide. This is a base. It's aqueous. And we are forming two products. So for these net ionic equations, what's useful is if you uh, identify the charges of all of the ions. Note that even acids and bases, think of that H plus as this plus one charge, hydroxide is a minus one, you still do the ion swapping for uh, neutralization reactions. So H plus is, you know, a plus one charge. Acetate is a negative one charge. What's the charge of strontium here? Two plus, what's the charge of hydroxide? Minus one. So then uh, just one of them, all right? Because the idea is we just want to swap ion partners and make sure that our products are charge balanced. So if we swap our partners, these are the new partners we make. So the first partner between H and OH, what is that? Water, HOH is water. Yeah, so H2O. What's the phase of H2O? Liquid, okay. Then the other product is strontium acetate. How many acetates do I need to put there? Two, yes. Okay, whoops, okay, I need to give myself more room. Okay, strontium, acetate, okay, two of them. Um, now we need to determine the phase of strontium acetate. Okay, so how do we determine the phase? So knowing that the phase of water, H2O is liquid, memorize that, know that water is a liquid. But strontium acetate, do we need to memorize if that is like what phase that is? No, what piece of information do we use? The solubility table, which you are always given. So uh, if we look at the solubility table, I don't even know where it is. Um, um, 
solubility table. Okay, right there. All right. So how we read this, things that are uh, up here are soluble, things that are down here are insoluble. So if we look at acetate, there are no exceptions. So that means strontium acetate is soluble. So what um, phase does it get? Aqueous, okay, very good. So that's our uh, full equation. Oh, it's not balanced. So quickly balance it by changing what? Coefficients. We already spent so much time changing the subscripts to make sure things were charge balanced. Now we just change coefficients to make sure that the atoms are balanced. So I need what? I need like two acetates here and I need two waters. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, so let's, uh, what's this question? Why is B and C strong? Because they are strong acids. All right, so that's the full, um, that's the balanced chemical equation. So now we need to write out the full chemical, the full um, ionic equation. So now we need to figure out what do we have to split? We need to figure out what we need to split into ions. All right, so what is the criteria of stuff we split in the full ionic equation? It needs to have two things. We split things that are ionic and aqueous. It has, or soluble, yeah. So it has to be ionic and aqueous. It has to be both, both. And we split it. So let's go through each thing and determine, do we split it or not? So acetic acid, do we split that? Yes. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, so actually, um, instead of ionic, I don't want to say ionic. I want to say a strong electrolyte. That's a, ionic is a little too specific. I want to be even more broad, all right? Because all strong electrolytes are ionic and are strong acids. So I want to be even more specific has to be a strong electrolyte. And remember how we uh, uh, identified strong electrolytes, they had to be strong acids or ionic. So it could be both because this first substance, um, acetic acid, is it a strong electrolyte? No, it's not. So my fault, my bad, all right? It's not a strong electrolyte because acetic acid is what kind of acid? It's weak, so we don't split it. No split, no, no split. Don't split it, keep it as is in the full ionic equation. What about strontium hydroxide? Do we split that? Yes, because it's ionic, right? You named it using ionic rules and it's aqueous. So we split that. Do we split water? No, because why? It's a liquid, yeah, so no split, all right? Uh, what about strontium acetate? Do we split that? Yes, because we, I named it using ionic naming rules and uh, it's aqueous, so we split that, all right? So, uh, okay, so let's do this. So we have two um, acetic acids, so two H2C3O2 aqueous. So I, knew, I didn't split it because it's a weak acid. Now I split strontium hydroxide. So I get uh, strontium aqueous and then hydroxide, but I get two of them. All right, I get two of those hydroxides because there are two anions for every one cation. We don't split water, keep it as is. Oh, sorry, there's two of them. We still have the coefficient though, okay? And then we split that strontium acetate. So we have strontium plus acetate C, oh, and there's two of them, C2H3O2. Okay, there we go. All right, aqueous. Sorry, that looks so bad. Um, so now the next part, this is the full ionic equation. This is not the net ionic equation. So to get the net, we uh, identify the spectator ions. Spectator ions are things that do not change at all from reactants to products. So we go through everything. See how acetate is combined um, on this side, but then acetate is uh, a free ion on the product side. So that doesn't change, so it does change. So that is not a spectator ion. There's actually only one spectator ion. And what is it? Strontium. So that's the only thing we remove for our net ionic equation. So another way um, we can ask this question is I would word it the exact same, but I would say something like, what is the spectator ion between these, this, this reaction? 
I'll say a common mistake for doing net ionic equations is students forget that um, for, for things to split, you'll get like real gung ho about splitting everything. Like everything will be ionic, um, but you'll forget this aqueous thing. Remember, it's how things look like in solution. So if it's a solid, like if I had like lead iodide solid, do I split that? No, you don't. You did this in lab, right? Where you made lead iodide. That's a solid. It's not in solution. Um, but students will get gung ho and they will just split everything. And so if they split everything, everything's a spectator ion. So don't do that. Don't do that. You have to uh, consider the aqueous form as well. All right. So, uh, okay, what's next? Yeah. There are two anions for every one cation. Uh, it's a minus, or sorry, this should just, this, there's two of them there. There's two of them there. Because there's two of them there. If I were, if there, if this was strontium chloride, you would have one strong, if that, if you split that, you would have a strontium and two chlorides. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Ooh, I get to get on my soap box. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to do number seven, titration. So, um, uh, so remember uh, the unit of molarity, all right? If I say something's 1.5 molarity, okay, molarity NaCl or something, that big M, like it means nothing to me. But if you reword it into a unit that's more useful, all right, molarity means what? Moles over liters. So if you rewrite this, okay, 1.5 moles, per liter of sodium chloride, we can write, rewrite this into an equality that means something to us. What it means, right? It's the unit on the top is equal to the unit on the bottom with an implied one. So I can rewrite that is 1.5 moles of sodium chloride is in one liter of solution. That's how I can use, um, uh, use uh, uh, dimensional analysis to change to whatever conversion, uh, change to whatever substance I want, whether I'm given a volume or given a mole amount, All right? So for this question, we're titrating phosphoric acid and it requires this much sodium hydroxide to reach the endpoint. So phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid. What is the concentration of phosphoric acid in this sample in molarity. So this question is asking for um, uh, phosphoric acid in molarity. So remember molarity, you told me it's moles per liter. So the concentration of phosphoric acid is the number of moles of phosphoric acid in the sample over the liters of the sample. So if we think about this picture, all right, we have like some titration going. There's phosphoric acid in here. There's sodium hydroxide in here in our burette. The phosphoric acid H3, um, which I'm just calling H3A because it's a triprotic acid. I'm just being lazy here. Um, how much uh, phosphoric acid is in here? Does it say? Sorry, how, 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 many, how many milliliters? 20, yes. Okay, 20 milliliters of my acid. So if we go back to this idea, this is our goal. We wanna get moles of uh, acid over liters of that acid. Um, actually, I should, instead of liters of solution, I should say liters of H3A. So what component do we already know? We know the denominator, don't we? We know the number of liters of, um, of acid. It's 20, it's 20 milliliters, it's given. We'll convert it to liters, but we know the denominator. We just need to figure out the numerator. We need to figure out how many moles of H3A of acid are present within there. So we need to start with a balanced chemical equation because a chemical reaction is happening right now. Neutralization. If I have phosphoric acid and I add sodium hydroxide, 
what's the mole ratio? How, how can I neutralize this? How many moles of acid or base do I need? Three moles of base. Do I need to actually balance the rest of the equation? No, I don't. I just need three moles of base because it's a triprotic acid. There are three acidic protons that I need to neutralize with a hydroxide each, right? I want to get through to you that there is a chemical reaction happening. We are given, all right, we're given moles of sodium hydroxide. I know how much I dispensed. So I can use stoichiometry to figure out, oh, how much acid did I start with, right? So the idea here, is uh, I know how much sodium hydroxide I use. So I'm gonna take that sodium hydroxide. Uh, so I'll do a different color, 0 0.01875. So that's in liters, that's of my sodium hydroxide, right? Let me quickly rewrite that sodium um, hydroxide molarity into something that's a little bit more meaningful to me, all right? So 0 0.4811 molarity means that there's 0 0.4811 moles of sodium hydroxide in one liter of solution. So if I'm in liters of solution of sodium hydroxide now, where am I gonna put the 0.48 moles? Am I gonna put that on the top or the bottom? Top, yeah, because I want liters to cancel. So I'm gonna put uh, one liter of sodium hydroxide on the bottom, 0 0.4811 moles of sodium hydroxide up top. So if I, um, did this math right now, what would the unit be? Moles of NaOH. Can I put that in here? No, I want moles of acid. So I need to do one more thing. What is that? The mole ratio, I need to do stoichiometry. So where am I gonna put that three? On the bottom, three moles of uh, sodium hydroxide is one mole of uh, H3A. And so that will give you some mole amount of H3A and that's what goes on the numerator. Okay, where is that? So I get something like, uh, okay, if I do that math, I get something like 0 0.0030069 moles of H3A. Okay, and then to get it into molarity, I just divide by the volume you started with, just make sure it's in liters. So 0 0.2000 liters, and you get something like 0 0.150 molarity of that acid, H3A. Okay, so how many of you are not in my class? Okay, wow, a lot of you. Okay, so if you, how many of you were taught to use the dilution equation to solve titrations? Okay. I'm here to tell you, and for those of you who are just scared to raise your hand, your high school teacher or whoever, they were lazy and they were wrong. You cannot use the dilution equation for this question. If you do, you use the dilution equation for this question, you will be off by a factor of three because a chemical reaction is happening, all right? That you are, it requires three extra, three times as much as more base to neutralize that acid. If you use M1V1 equals M2V2, you will be wrong. Never use the dilution equation for titrations. Your high school teacher was lazy. Okay. Dilutions are physical changes. This is a chemical change, yeah. Uh, why, why do I do 20 mils and not 18? Because I want the concentration of the original acid solution. You only, like I, I started with like a stock solution of acid and I only transferred 20 milliliters of it into my Erlenmeyer. I want the concentration of the original stuff, not of the final uh, mixture, yeah. Hey guys, can you quiet down please? Uh, no, triprotic acid means that there are three protons, three H pluses, three H pluses. Uh, doesn't mean that you need three times as much uh, base because I could say, oh, what if we um, uh, 
titrate a diprotic acid with calcium hydroxide? What would that equation look like? A diprotic acid would be something like H2A plus calcium hydroxide. How many hydroxides are on a calcium hydroxide? Two, yeah, so it's CaOH, two of them. And so in this case, the coefficients are actually one to one, yeah. So the dye refers to this part. Yeah, good question. Okay, what else? Yeah. Okay. So we have another chemical reaction here. So we are combining sodium hydroxide and magnesium chloride to produce a cloudy mixture. What am I doing? <clears throat> What's the identity of the precipitate? So in this question, we also need to figure out what freaking reaction's happening. So uh, take sodium hydroxide, that's what we're starting with. It's aqueous and we're taking magnesium chloride. It's also aqueous and we're forming products. How do we predict the products? We swap ions, all right? So knowing the charges, super helpful, kind of necessary here. Sodium is plus, hydroxide is minus. Magnesium is what charge? Plus two, what's chloride? Minus one, so we swap partners. So our first product here is magnesium hydroxide, two of them, and then sodium chloride. So we just need one and one of those, All right? So uh, we can note how I don't have the phases. How do we get the phases? Solubility table. So if we go to the solubility table, Hydroxides are typically insoluble. And so we see magnesium is not one of the exceptions. So that means magnesium uh, hydroxide is what phase? Solid, solid. And then NaCl, see how we have chloride, it's aqueous, so it is uh, uh, soluble, so it's aqueous. So if we go back here, our um, uh, phases are solid and aqueous. There we go, so that's our... Um, that's our equation, but it's not balanced. So let's just make sure we balance it or we get ahead of ourselves. So uh, magnesiums look okay. It looks like I need two NaCLs and two hydroxide, sodium hydroxides. All right, now that's balanced. So we answered the first question, the identity of the precipitate. What's the precipitate? Magnesium hydroxide, great. Now we need to figure out how many moles of precipitate is formed? And we wanna know what is the concentration of all of the ions in the resulting solution? So I'm just gonna answer all of them at the same time, uh, B and C. So this requires what? Everyone's favorite, a BCA table, yay. Uh, because a BCA table, a BCA table will tell us the concentration of all the ions after the reaction is done not just the product, all right? So if we did, you know, just the typical stoichiometry we did do, we, we could figure out moles of magnesium hydroxide, but we'd have to do a ton of work to get the moles of everything else. I'll show you, it's not too bad. I tried to use easy numbers, all right? So B, C, A. So before we start the reaction, we're mixing these things together. We have one liter of two molarity sodium hydroxide and one, liter of two molarity, whatever. All right, uh, to, to form, once we combine one liter and one liter, there's two liters total. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Okay, so based upon these numbers, I try to use real easy numbers. How many moles of sodium hydroxide is that? Two, two moles of NaOH. How many moles of magnesium chloride is that? Two, yes, it's two moles. So where do those numbers go? In the BCA, so we have two moles of sodium hydroxide, two moles of magnesium chloride. How many moles of product do I have at the beginning of the reaction? Zero, okay, great. All right, so next step, we figured out the before line. So the change line, we figure out, we need to figure out what the limiting reactant is. So looking at these things, what reactant's gonna run out first? Na NaOH, how did you get NaOH? You need twice as much. Yeah, you need twice as much. I think an example I used in office hours today, the cheese and bread thing. If you have two breads uh, uh, and, and one cheese to make a sandwich, right? 
Do you have uh, four breads and four cheeses? Do you, what ingredient runs out first? Bread, because you use it twice as fast, right? If you have the same amount of both, whatever is consumed faster runs out first, all right? So we identified the limiting reactant as sodium hydroxide. It's okay if you, if you pick the wrong one and you move on with the steps, you'll get negative numbers in the after line. And I hope that will indicate to you, oh, that's not possible. I should repick the other limiting reactant. All right, so if we identify the limiting reactant, what that means is it gets completely consumed. So if it's completely consumed, how many moles of sodium hydroxide are left over? Zero. Zero. So now we have a piece of the change line. The change line is all, always uh, dictated by stoichiometry. The ratios will be exactly the same. So if we have two, if we consume two moles of sodium hydroxide based upon the stoichiometry, how many moles of magnesium chloride will we consume as well? Negative two? Negative one, see how it's a two to one ratio, right? So for every two sodium hydroxides, I consume one magnesium chloride. How many magnesium hydroxides do I get? So it's a plus here. One, and then how many sodium chlorides? Plus two, yes. And so now we add everything up. So zero, one mole of magnesium chloride. And then we have one mole of magnesium hydroxide. I'm gonna put the states here, okay? aqueous, and then um, two moles of NaCl aqueous. So if we took a picture of our beaker, everything in this after line is what's in our beaker, including the states. That's the important part here. So um, we answered the question, the B, right? We answered B. What's the answer to B? One mole. Okay, that's the easy one. Now the harder one is C the concentration of all of the ions in solution. But the idea is all we have to do is identify, go through each of them one at a time, figure out the sources of them to figure out their concentrations. So let's consider sodium first, sodium concentration. Of these three things that are in here, what gives off sodium ions? NaCl, how many moles of Na plus does the NaCl give us? Two, there are two moles of NaCl present. Is that a concentration? No, we need to divide by liters. What liter amount do we divide by? Two, why two? Because yeah, we added the two. We got that? Yeah, so it's two, uh, two moles of, uh, sorry, not NaCl, I want Na plus. Uh, two, two liters. So the concentration of NaCl after this reaction is done is one molarity. Okay. Which one's next? Hydroxide? Okay. All right. Hydroxide. What are the sources of hydroxide in solution? Uh, in the after line. None. Very good. Yeah. So NaOH is correct. All right, because NaOH is aqueous, but in the after line, is there any NaOH? No, there's not. So a common mistake students will do is they'll see, oh, no, magnesium hydroxide has hydroxide in it. But is it in solution? No, it's not. It's a solid at the bottom. So it's not dissolved in solution. So the concentration of hydroxide in this example is zero, yay. Okay, next, uh, magnesium. Magnesium two plus. So where are our sources of magnesium? Magnesium chloride. So how many moles of magnesium chloride do I have? Or sorry, just uh, magnesium two plus. One. And so over two liters, the concentration of magnesium is half molarity. Okay. All right, so now let's do the hard one. Let's do chloride. So looking at the after line, what are our sources of chloride? Yeah, magnesium chloride and sodium chloride. So we need to account for both of them. So how many moles of uh, chloride does magnesium chloride give us? Is it one mole of chloride or 
two moles because there's two anions there. So it's two moles of chloride that comes from magnesium chloride. And then how many moles of chloride come from NaCl? Two, because there's two moles of NaCl present. So two moles of chloride divided by two liters equals uh, two molarity. Wait, is that right? Yeah, okay, good. And that's it. Okay, so the questions here are, why is the volume two liters? Is because we mix one liter of one solution, one liter of another solution, making two liters total. The next question is, magnesium is in excess from the reactants. Uh, that's um, true, yes. Oh wait, why would Mg not be zero? Oh yeah, okay, that's why, because uh, there's magnesium chloride left over. We're looking at the stuff in the after line. Um, okay, there we go. Next. Six, 26. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Consider, I would, okay, so I think a lot of, uh, how many questions was midterm one? 26. And so this midterm is 33 questions. And a, the big reason for that is like tons of chapter six is conceptual, low hanging fruit questions. All right. So questions where I, if I say, how many valence electrons does lithium have? That should take you one half a second. Yes, one. Yeah. Um, no, it's too easy. Um, so a lot of these questions, these conceptual ones, hey guys, don't want to end early because my voice is tired. All right. So let's uh, consider these two orbitals. We have a 3p orbital and a 4p orbital. So remember, these orbitals are telling the reader where to find electron density uh, based upon these energies here. So um, when I say 3p and 4p, I'm talking about uh, specific quantum numbers here. I'm, I'm trying to indicate to you certain quantum numbers. Remember there's four, N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And so the idea is here is 3P is indicating N equals three, L equals one. Uh, 4P is N equals four, L equals uh, uh, one. So I guess I can write that N equals one, um, N equals three, L equals one, while well, four P is N equals four, L equals one. So let's see if we can't answer some of these questions. We want the false statement, okay. A three P orbital must have the same angular quantum number L as four P, is that true or false? That's true, I just said it, right? They're both P orbitals, so both of their Ls have to be, L remember, uh, indicate shape, both of them have to be one because they're P orbitals, all right. 4p is higher in energy than 3p. That's also true. Yes. All right. Because n of 4 is higher than energy than n of 3. That's like a Bohr model thing, but it holds true for quantum, quantum, uh, the Schrodinger model as well. All right. Uh, 3p orbital must have the same orientation as 4p. True or false? So if you're confused, maybe it might be false because the idea here is orientation is indicated by what quantum number? M sub L, all right? So for P orbitals, how many, uh, or P subshell, how many boxes, how many orbitals are there? Three, meaning that there are three possible M sub Ls, minus one, zero, plus one. These are indicated by um, uh, subscripts. We can say this is PX, PY, PZ. It, we can put an electron in any one of those. All of those energy level, um, those boxes, those orbitals within a P subshell are degenerate. It costs the same amount of energy to put an electron in PX. I could put it in PY. I could put it in PZ upside down. All of those are valid places to put an electron. So that idea here, does the question or the statement here, does it say anything about M sub L? No, it doesn't. So that means C cannot be true, all right? Because I'm trying to say, hey, that the orientation of this orbital must be the same as this one. That's not true because I didn't tell you anything about M sub L. You see that? 
Okay, so this is the false one, but let's look at the last one for completeness, because maybe you could do it by process of elimination. I don't know. So um, 3P has the same number of lobes as a 4P orbital. Is that true or false? So look, but by number of lobes, I mean the shape, right? The shape. So what does a 3P orbital look like? Just like a dumbbell. What does a 4P orbital look like? A dumbbell, but bigger. Yeah, so it has the same number of lobes. So the D would be correct too. So maybe by process of elimination, you would get at it. But I think the idea here is that in C, M sub L, or yeah, is not indicated. Correct, but did I say nodes? That's a good question, yeah. I Do I have one of those questions on here? Yeah, let's just do 25. Okay. Since we got on the topic of nodes, okay, let's, let's quiet down. I'm getting tired. So let's do 25 because we got on the topic of radial nodes and angular nodes. So the two equations I would say to just memorize, I'm gonna write them down. I'm gonna write them down exactly once is that the number of angular nodes for a um, orbital is equal to whatever L value is given. And then the number of radial nodes is equal to the n value of the orbital given minus the l value of the orbital given minus one. Just memorize those. So if you're given an orbital, if I say like 3p, or if I say 5d, you can plug those into this equation or these equations to figure out how many angular nodes. Sometimes they're called nodal planes. That's the same, it's the same definition, they're synonyms. Nodal plane and the number of angular nodes. Same, um, radial nodes are different here. Okay, so let's um, consider a 5D orbital. Let's dissect it. What's the N value for a 5D orbital? Five, yes. Okay, what's the L? Two, where do you get two? Uh, so, so what piece of information given is that L equals two? D, yeah, so D equals L of two. So remember for L values, we can have zero, one, two, three. Um, S, P, D, uh, and then three would be F, okay. What are the possible M sub Ls for this subshell? Negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two. So on an energy level diagram, how many boxes would be in a 5D orbital or 5D subshell, sorry? Five boxes, so that means five orbitals how many electrons can fit in a 5D subshell? 10, very good, okay. All right, so now let's get a little harder using those uh, equations. So how many angular nodes does a 5D orbital possess? Two. And so students ask me like, what the heck is an angular node? So these numbers for L values are not arbitrary. For the new newbies out here, these orbital shapes that we think of, you might've memorized them in um, high school, but in college, we learned that these numbers are actually solutions to the Schrodinger equation, right? These are the numbers that come out. We typically know S orbitals are spherical, P orbitals are the barbell, D orbitals for the most part look like butterflies, and F orbitals are very complex. And so those numbers, the analogy I make is uh, those numbers are the number of angular nodes in that shape. Uh, so no one ever knows what an angular node is, so I like to compare it to balloon animals, all right? So if you have a balloon and you wanna make an S orbital shape, how many times do you have to twist the balloon? Zero, so L equals zero. If you have a balloon and wanna make a P orbital, how many times do you twist the balloon? Once, L equals one. If you wanna make a butterfly with a balloon, how many times do you twist it to get the four lobes? No, uh, you, need, you need four lobes. So you twist it once and then you like fold it in half and then you twist it again. So that's two 
angular nodes. All right, so that's what those are what the numbers mean. I don't know if you're listening, but okay, all right, that's what the numbers mean. They're not arbitrary. Okay, so let's just keep going. How many radial nodes does a 5D orbital possess? Plug it in. Yeah, two. So it would be five minus two minus one equals two. So let's draw the radial probability graph of the 5D orbital. So we'll just do the uh, wave function squared. That's the probability. And this is on the x-axis distance from the nucleus. All right. So we want to draw a radial probability graph with two radial nodes. So the graph needs to go to zero twice. But do we count the beginning and end? No. So this has, okay, actually, this has how many radial nodes? Zero. Zero. This has how many radial nodes? One. This has two, where the radial nodes are right here. So you never count the beginning and end. Because at the beginning, here, you'll never find an electron at d equals zero. Because d equals zero is the nucleus. Electrons don't live in the nucleus. And then electrons also don't live, you know, infinitely away from the, uh, from the atom. So. Okay, why isn't the angular node one if it was written as being equal to one? I don't know what that means. Yeah. I can't hear you. Uh, M sub L's depend on what L you're in, what you're given. Uh, so if you have uh, L of two, for example, you do all of the integers between negative and positive L. Yeah. So like an L of one would be minus one, zero plus one. Okay. What's next? What? Oh, I love these questions. <clears throat> okay, 22. This is a question that will take you exactly three seconds to answer if you are real good. And these questions are great because um, there's a billion ways we can ask them. So this question is based upon the Bohr model, all right, where we have electron transitions uh, occurring. Light is only involved when electrons undergo transitions. The energy of that light that's emitted or absorbed is dependent on how big the energy gap is where that electron is moving between energy levels. So with this question, the first thing you need to start with is an appropriately spaced energy level diagram. So I'm gonna draw two of them and you tell me which one is appropriately spaced. So, um, all right, that one, or how many I need to draw five? Or that one, the first one. What's wrong with the second one? They're evenly spaced. Energy level diagrams for the hydrogen atom, as you go up in energy, the energy levels get closer together. So the important thing is you need to start with an appropriately spaced energy level diagram. If you draw it this way, you will be wrong. Actually, you can't answer the question if you, answer, if you draw it this way. So we have to start it uh, this way, where N equals one is on the bottom, two, three, four, five. Right. So there's my energy level diagram. So this question is asking which transition of an electron will result in absorption of a photon with the shortest wavelength. So this question is broken up into two parts. Absorption means if a photon is absorbed, energy is going into the atom. So how will the electron change? It goes up, it jumps. So we're looking for a jump in N energy level. So that means we can like eliminate half of them. That's great. Okay. So then the idea is we need the, we're looking for the shortest wavelength. So wavelength, so um, is this diagram, what's the y-axis? What's the y-axis? Is, is the y-axis wavelength? No, it's energy. So how are wavelength and energy related? Inversely, yeah, so shorter the wavelength, larger the energy. So are we looking for a uh, short energy jump or a large energy jump? 
large. We're looking for a large energy jump. All right. And so that's what we do. We, we, uh, so we can eliminate half of these. A is actually a mission. B is a mission. Four is absor absorption. D is absorption. Uh, e is a mission. So we're just looking at C and D here. So we can draw one to five and we can draw four to five. So which transition is the highest energy transition? Uh, D, yeah, so it's the one to five, the highest energy jump, highest energy jump. We realize it's jump because it says absorption. If it said emission of a photon, how would it change? What would we look for instead? A fall, a big fall or a little fall? Big fall, because again, short wavelength. What if I said emission of the smallest frequency? Emission of the smallest frequency. Yeah, we were looking for a drop that's small. All right. So again, relate all of this to energy, relate emission versus absorption. How, how is light involved? So remember, light is only involved when that electron is moving between energy levels. When an electron is just hanging out, chilling in N equals one, energy is not, uh, photons are not being emitted or absorbed. That's the second um, tenant, the second postulate of the Bohr model. And that's why we can have stable atoms because they're not radiating energy when they're in that energy level. Okay, so. Okay. All right, well, let's just do 23. Okay, which statement about de Broglie's work is false? So de Broglie uh, did what? The wavelength, all right, so there's the de Broglie wavelength equation. Are we given that on the exam? Yes. So it's uh, de Broglie wavelength is H, C, mass cut over volume or velocity. Is there any C in there? No, okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> all right, so, um, so, uh, oh, okay, uh, a question I get all the time, right? There's actually two equations we use for wavelength, right? And some students are like, well, when do I use what? So this is one of the equations we use to calculate wavelength. Um, the other one is like, you know, E equals uh, HC over lambda or C equals new wavelength, all right? So these two equations um, consider the wave nature of light. Okay, the wave nature, the electromagnetic radiation nature of light. See how there's no mass unit in it, okay? Versus uh, the de Broglie wavelength, it doesn't have to do with light. It doesn't have to do with light, it has to do with objects because the, uh, uh, one of the variables in here is mass. What de Broglie said and what was Nobel Prize worthy uh, for him was that he said all matter possesses a wavelength as long as it's moving through space. but for us, it's really only electrons that have uh, um, measurable de Broglie wavelengths because their mass is so small. Because the idea here is if you have a really large number from like if I'm walking across this, this uh, 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 lecture room at a certain velocity, I have a wavelength, but because my mass is so big, that wavelength is going to be a tiny number. It's going to be like to the negative 50 or something. Uh, that you can't measure it. But when you put the mass of an electron in, in here, it is a value you can actually measure, all right? And so uh, uh, de Broglie's, uh, this is how he got his PhD. The chemistry department almost didn't give it to him, all right? Because they were, they were basically like, that's crazy. Matter doesn't have wavelengths. But basically he was just saying, hey, if we can say light is a wave and a particle, a photon, why can't we say particles are also waves? Like it's not that big of a leap. And it, like his work was one of those examples where it didn't take until later for us to realize and find experimental evidence that electrons do in fact act as waves. And that's using electron microscopy. And uh, we can see the constructive and deconstructive uh, wave nature of electrons. Okay, there's my spiel. That's why it matters. So let's uh, select the de Broglie. So, okay, so the whole point I was getting at, you use this equation, this one, the de Broglie one, when you're given a mass. 
when mass when when an object is moving we use this equation when we're talking about light does light have mass is light matter can you put light in a jar and keep it in there no you can't so then it's not matter okay all right so uh a is that true or false true yes b de Broglie wavelength of an electron is longer than the wavelength of a proton true why yeah a massive electron is super small and the mass of a proton is super big so Proton's going to have a tiny wavelength, electron's going to be larger. Okay. De Broglie model of this based on the idea of a standing wave at certain distance from the nucleus. True. Yes. Um, because it, that was the first instance instead of the, uh, um, you know, the Bohr model saying, oh, we just have this electron particle orbiting the, uh, the nucleus. De Broglie said, no, the electron's a standing wave where all of the crests and, and the, the wave, uh, uh, connects continuously within the orbits around a uh, uh, a nucleus. Okay, larger the object, larger the de Broglie wavelength. False. Yes. Yeah, just look at the equation. Okay. All right. Why does the Bohr model violate the uncertainty principle? So remember, the Bohr model is this. Okay, energy level. We say, oh, you can put an electron in n equals one. What does the uncertainty principle say? That the uh, uncertainty in position times uh, uncertainty in um, momentum has to be greater than or equal to uh, some constant, all right? A really small number. Um, so the idea here is that when working with, so we can actually pull that mass value out because mass of an object doesn't typically change, right? So what we see here is that for electrons, mass is really 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 small times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms so if mass is a small number the uncertainties actually have to be pretty large in order to overcome this minima when we're working with really large objects mass is already huge we can have really great precision on large objects but for electrons because mass is small it's hard to overcome this uh oh that's not h bar um there you go sorry h bar is just two or h over two so, okay anyway uh what was i saying yeah large objects fine to have really great precision that's classical physics that's deterministic type of theory that you can know everything about everything at every second in time you can't do that with electrons because they're so small it violates the uncertainty principle. So um, why does the Bohr model violate the uncertainty principle? Okay, so in the Bohr model, values of energy levels were known precisely. So that's, uh, I'm pretty sure, hold on. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, not true, or sorry, that's um, fine to do because we do the same thing in the Schrodinger model as well, that we set the energy levels with precision. But what happens is that then we need to have the, uh, uh, position of the electrons uh, have large uncertainty. So the more we know about one component, the less we know about the other. So the idea is we're setting energy uh, to have precision. So that means that we have to have a lot of uncertainty with the other component position. So A is okay. Uh, B, emission of a photon only occurs when an electron decreases its energy level. Does that have to do with the uncertainty principle? No, but is it true? Yes, it is true, but it has nothing to do with the uncertainty principle. Um, electrons are only allowed in certain energy levels. That is the reason why the Bohr model violates it. Because when you say, hey, you have an electron in N equals one, do you know a lot about its position or not a lot about its position? No, I, I'm saying, hey, that, that electron's in N equals one. Yeah, I, that means I'm saying, I'm locking that electron in one place. So that's a small delta X, that's a small uncertainty in X. Uh, so we can't have that. So C is the correct answer. Okay. I'm tired. Okay, last question. What? Okay. 
Okay, yeah, so we'll do 28. Draw the most stable electron configuration for an oxygen atom. So the idea here is you locate oxygen on the periodic table. This is your S block, that's your P block. So you start at hydrogen and you work your way up to oxygen. So the electron configuration is one S, uh, two of them, you need two electrons there. So that brings you to helium. Now you fill lithium beryllium. What subshell is that? Two S, yes, because this is the S block and you count you know, one you know, all the way down. So two S, two electrons, right? So now we're at boron. What subshell does that start? P, which P? 2p no why not 1p there is no 1p yeah so it's 2p how many electrons four okay so there's our um, electron configuration so now the next question is how many unpaired electrons are there on this oxygen atom so this requires us to draw the electron um diagram so we draw the boxes so an s orbital has one orbital one box how many um boxes do I draw for a 2s subshell? Also one box because it's an s subshell. What about a p subshell? Three boxes, yes. Okay, so now you just place the electrons following the rules. So if I put an electron in 1s, where does the next one go? 1s, but what's special about it? Spin down. All right, then um, 2s and then uh, 2p. So again, be careful with your electrons uh we don't we want to follow hun's rule here so we maximize spin first before we start pairing up all right this minimizes electron repulsion all right so there we go so now the answer how many unpaired electrons are there there's one two so unpaired electrons are electrons that don't have spinning partners so two okay what's the possible quantum numbers for the highest energy electron on an oxygen atom so the highest energy electron is usually the last electron I placed. So we want to talk about that electron. We want to talk about the quantum numbers for this last electron that I wrote. So what is the n value for that electron? Two. How'd you get that? It's in 2p. So then what's the l value? One. So now this is where it gets tricky. Is there uh, a certain ML value that that electron can be in? No, yeah, it could be any of them. It doesn't matter because the idea is, well, why? Well, why did I draw that electron spin down on that last or on the uh, leftmost box? It's just because I felt like it because I read left to right. There's actually no, hey guys, let's, do you want me to finish the question? Okay, yeah. So there's there's no difference energetically if I put the electron here, if I put the electron here, if I put the electron there, there's no difference energetically, no difference, okay? So the possible ML values are actually all of them, negative one, zero, and positive one. It's, we're, we don't lock that last electron in, um, in a certain place, all right? And the same thing with spin. The spin doesn't have to be spin down. I could just flip everything on its side and it could be spin up that one uh, that one last electron yeah. Oh yeah I didn't answer that one. Yeah so I sorry I didn't answer B. Sorry yeah so the answer is six uh, six valence electrons for oxygen, so how we get valence electrons are all of the electrons in the highest n value right so we only count. 2s and uh, 2p but the trick is for main group elements so s and p block uh the valence electrons are always equal to group number 